Hi there. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, today we have Dr. James Adams of Arizona State University. Thank you so much, Dr. Adams, for joining us today. Just gonna give people a little bit of a background on you and then we'll have you take away with your presentation. So um, Dr. James Adams is director of the Autism Asperger's Research Program at Arizona State University, working in conjunction with physicians, nutritionists, biochemists, and others. His research is focused on the causes and treatment of autism across the lifespan. Dr. Adams believes the addition of research-based biomedical therapy to treat individuals with autism spectrum disorder can improve the effectiveness of ongoing educational, therapeutic, and behavioral interventions. Dr. Adams has a PhD in materials engineering, but for the last 20 years has focused his research on the biological causes of autism and how to treat it. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed scientific articles, including 50 on autism. He has led many clinical trials, including nutritional supplementation, microbiota transplant, and detoxification. And today we're going to talk about your new study. So please, take it away. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so this is a very unusual study, um, and the reference to it is down here if you want to look at the full paper. What's unusual about this study is most clinical trials focus on a single treatment. But in reality, we know that a single treatment will usually only yield a small benefit for a small number of uh, people with autism. So what we wanted to do is combine six different nutritional treatments. That, we provide, that way we provide all of the primary nutrients that um, someone would need for a healthy body and a healthy mind. And so we put all six of these treatments together into an unusually long study, a 12-month study, and um, observe the benefits of it. And so I do need to make a disclaimer that I am the president of the Autism Nutrition Research Center. That's a nonprofit that I created, which produces the vitamin mineral supplement uh, based on a research studies. But I serve as a volunteer. I don't receive any salary or royalties uh, from, the, uh, from ANRC. So this study involved um, two physicians, it involved a nutritional biochemist, two nutritionists, a study coordinator, a study nurse, uh, two expert autism evaluators, and several other staff. So this is a quite huge 12-month study with a lot of experts involved. What I want to do is briefly explain the goal of the study. I'll give a little bit of background on each of the six nutritional treatments we uh, tried, and then I'll explain how we put them all together one by one to design a comprehensive nutritional support and then at the end, I'll explain the, the results and the implications and explain how you could try this on your own if you want to. Um, so the purpose of the study is not to study the effect of just one treatment, but to look at looking at all at a combination of six different nutritional and dietary interventions to try to um, provide comprehensive nutritional support uh, for children and adults with autism. Um, and so the six treatments that we combined are a customized vitamin mineral supplement that we had done a previous study on, uh, fish oil, which is important for omega-3 fatty acids, Epsom salt baths, because they're a great source of magnesium sulfate, and most children with autism are very low in sulfate, uh, carnitine to support mitochondrial functioning, because about 40% of people with autism have mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, digestive enzymes, because many people with autism uh, lack certain digestive enzymes. And finally, a healthy diet that's also allergen-free. And so we're going to look at the effect of combining all six of these treatments together over the course of one year. But I want to give a brief explanation of each one of these six treatments first and the research behind it. For vitamins and minerals, people forget that this is an essential nutrient. Each vitamin and each mineral, it's known that if you have a low enough amount of it, it will cause disease or even death. They're absolutely essential. Your body cannot make them. You must get them from your diet. Unfortunately, although we've known about vitamins and minerals for over 100 years, many people still have poor diets. Many women don't get enough calcium, leading to osteoporosis. Uh, many of them have low iron, leading to anemia. So unfortunately, vitamin and mineral deficiencies and insufficiencies are very common still. And so the treatment is very simple. 
eat your vegetables, eat your fruits, eat protein sources, and um, through that combination, you can hopefully do very well. But unfortunately, many Western diets are lacking in certain key vitamins and minerals, so people need to take a supplement. Um, we have previously done do, two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled studies. One was a small study. We found significant improvements in sleep and gut problems. And then a second study we did 10 years ago looked at very extensive measurements of nutritional and metabolic problems and then treating them with our special vitamin mineral supplement. And I have the references for you there. Um, we We found many of three, low glutathione, the main antioxidant and protection against toxic metals, and therefore high oxidative stress, impaired methylation, which is important for um, many functions in the body, including turning genes on and off, very low sulfate, low levels of most of the major neurotransmitters, low plasma amino acids, some children with low iodine, which worldwide is the leading cause of uh, mental disability. Uh, low lithium, um, which we previously found at low in autism, and high amounts of toxic metals. If you have low glutathione, your body can't um, excrete toxic metals very well. What really surprised us is that our vitamin mineral supplement was able to improve almost every one of these markers and often just outright normalize them. Um, so it was quite surprising and impressive to me. But what's probably of greater interest to families is the effect on symptoms. So this is a list of different symptoms. And this is a scale of zero, meaning no benefit, one slight benefit, two good benefit, three great benefit. And it also goes negative. Wait, and what um, we see hey, is I'm sorry to interrupt, Dr. Arms. I, I don't know if you're showing an actual slide. Uh, we, we, we can see slide number one right now. Oh, you can't see all the other slides? Yeah, we can see all the slides, but currently it's in slide one. I'm on about slide six or so. Okay, can you can you advance maybe on your end? Um, all right, let me try getting out of slideshow mode. Okay. Uh, is this any better? Can you see a slide showing lots of different, um, bar, showing a bar graph? Um, I, I can I can only see I, I can only see a slide one. Hmm. Um, okay, I'm not sure how to fix that. Um, I can I, see, on my end, I can see a bar graph. Okay, perfect. Okay, so if you're able to see it, that's 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 probably, okay. Yeah, I can see that now. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'll stay in this mode then. Um, so this is a bar graph, and what we're showing here is for each symptom, like expressive language. Blue is the group that received placebo. And so it's interesting that we can give a fake pill with no active ingredients and people's perception are that they do a little bit better. And so boy, this placebo was good stuff. It improved a wide variety of symptoms a little bit. But the real supplement is in red. And you'll see that for every symptom, it was more effective. And the ones we star, the difference was statistically significant. So bottom line is for every one of these symptoms we looked at, the treatment, the children and the adults who received the real vitamin mineral supplement did better. And what's especially important is probably the average of all the symptoms. They did about twice as well. So it's not a cure, but for many children, for most children and adults with autism, it's a significant noticeable benefit. Um, so uh, next treatment I wanna talk about is essential fatty acids, um, which are, as I said, essential. Um, there are two major types of fatty acids in the body, omega-3 and omega-6. Most people on Western diets get plenty of omega-6, but they don't get enough omega-3s. And pretty much the only major source of omega-3s left in the diet is fish. And so if you're not eating two servings of fish a week, you probably have low levels of omega-3s. Um, low levels of fatty acids, especially omega-3s, a link to a wide range of psychiatric disorders, including depression, postpartum depression, 
um, bipolar, and Rett syndrome. And there are 15 studies. There's been a meta-analysis of 15 studies of 1,200 people with autism showing that on average, they have low levels of the two primary omega-3s, EPA and DHA, and also lower amounts of arachidonic acid. And so I think that's pretty compelling data that most people with autism want to consider it. But we also have four treatment studies. It's been a meta-analysis of four small studies, totaling only 100 people, which uh, found that compared to placebo, omega-3s helped improve social interaction and helped improve restricted interest in behaviors. Um, the limitation of those studies is they were low dose and very short, only six to 16 weeks. But we know from blood measurements, it takes about four months for um, omega-3s to build up to, a, to reach a full level. And so um, I think that these studies underestimated the true effect. And so you'll see in our study, we used a higher dose for a longer time and found more benefit. Um, sulfation is the third treatment we included. Uh, the reason is very simple. Children with autism have low amounts of, of sulfate in their blood because they pee out high amounts in their urine. Their kidneys don't work well and they don't recycle the sulfate. Sulfate is the fourth most common mineral in your body. So calcium is number one, but sulfate's number four. So it's also very important. Um, sulfate deficiency is almost unheard of in the general population, except people with autism. About 90% of people with autism have very major sulfate problems. They need it for many reasons, including inactivating key neurotransmitters to help detoxify a variety of substances, to help make new brain tissue, and to lubricate the GI tract. A colleague of mine at New York University found the two best ways to give it were either oral MSM, that's a nutritional supplement you can buy in most health food stores, or Epsom salts, which have been used for centuries for aches and pains, um, but both the magnesium and the sulfate are very well absorbed uh, in the body. Um, and quite a few studies showing that some by our group, some by others, showing children with autism have low levels in their blood. They have decreased ability to detoxify acetaminophen, that's the standard test for sulfate, and that they have high amounts in their urine. Molybdenum helps a little bit with um, uh, sulfate and improving mitochondrial functioning, but only in a subset of kids. So um, next, the fourth treatment, I want to talk about is carnitine. Carnitine is important for mitochondrial functioning. So this is a little picture of a, a typical human cell. And so you have the cell membrane here, and then you have the nucleus of the cell, and these green regions of the mitochondria. So every cell has, virtually every cell in the body has many, many mitochondria, and their, one of their main functions is to produce energy in the form of ATP. So it's the major energy source for most of the body and for the brain. And most children with autism have problems with them. Excuse me, about 40% of kids with autism have a mitochondrial problem. Carnitine helps mitochondria by transporting uh, long chain fatty acids, basically fuel into the mitochondria so they can burn it to make ATP. Um, one study found low levels of carnitine in kids with autism. I helped with a randomized study where we found benefit in three months at a relatively high dose. And then a second study went twice as long or twice the dose, they found even more benefit. Um, and so again, very promising. Uh, the fifth treatment I'll touch on briefly is digestive enzymes. Um, you need your body excretes digestive enzymes in your GI tract to help you digest your food. But three major studies from um, where they measured the amount of digestive enzymes produced in children and young adults with autism, they found they have decreased ability to excrete certain enzymes for digesting carbohydrates, especially excreting low amounts of lactase. That's the enzyme needed to digest the sugar in milk called lactose. So bottom line is many kids with autism are lactose intolerant and many people around the world are lactose intolerant. Um, 
And so there's been one open label study suggesting digest digestive enzymes might help. We need more research to figure out exactly what enzymes to use. And then the sixth treatment, and I think one of the most important ones, is improving the diet. We're going to suggest something radical here. Eat three to four servings a day of fruits and vegetables. Eat your cabbage, eat your broccoli, eat your green beans, eat your fruits and vegetables. Um, so important. Um, and also getting enough protein. Some children with autism don't get enough protein. Um, decreasing sugar and candy, avoiding junk food, avoiding fried foods, artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives can cause irritability and hyperactivity, especially in kids with autism whose um, detoxification system may not work as well. And then finally, eating organic foods. You know, pesticides are deadly, deadly to insects, but also they're often deadly to humans as well. So you, you're better off uh, eating your foods without pesticides, or if you can't avoid that, at least wash them well, maybe peel the outside. Um, and so um, another option to improve the diet is to avoid common allergens. Um, so gluten and casein are common allergens. If you think about it, humans are the only mammal on the planet to consume milk past the age of weaning and we're the only mammal on the planet to consume the milk of another species. So cow's milk is a perfect food for baby cows. It's not so great for babies and even worse for um, children and adults. So it can be, it does have a lot of good nutrients, but it also can be a common allergen. Uh, wheat also has been varied greatly in the last several hundred years. It's been bred to greatly increase the gluten content and more and more people are becoming gluten sensitive. So it's important to try avoiding these foods because they're common food allergens. It's their hypotheses and some limited evidence that peptides from these, um, uh, which are small proteins from the gluten and casein may bind to opioid receptors in the brain and cause behavioral problems. The lactose in milk sugar may not be easily digested causing loose stools or gas. And milk consumption seems to increase the rate of cerebral folate deficiency. And there's new evidence to suggest that maybe 20% of kids with autism have a cerebral folate deficiency. So briefly, we put all of these six treatments together, just like uh, many uh, integrative physicians do. We started out with a vitamin mineral supplement. 30 days later, we continued that and added in fish oil. 30 days after that, we added in Epsom salts. 30 days after that, we added carnitine and then digestive enzymes and then a healthy diet that's um, gluten-free, dairy-free. And then one year later, we assessed everyone. Um, in addition, this was a randomized single blind study because we're changing people's diets. The parents know if they're changing their diets or not but our evaluators were blinded. So they didn't know who was in the treatment group and who was in the control group. So we asked half the families not to make any changes to their diets, the medications, the therapies for one year. And bless their hearts, they waited one year to make any changes. So they're a control group. And the reason they were willing to wait is at the end of one year, they received all the treatments for another year. Um, so. We had a blinded expert who did some of the evaluations. So they didn't know who was in the treatment group and who wasn't. And then we have some parent reports. And the parents are not blinded. So that is open label data. Um, so briefly, we had 37 children and adults start the study. And 12 months later, 28 finished, which is really good for such a long study. Three dropped out due to lack of interest. Four, we had to disqualify because they didn't take the supplements very consistently. And only two of them, only two out of 37, had enough adverse effects. They had to withdraw from the vitamin mineral supplement and stopped most other supplements. But then they did choose to do our special healthy diet. And that helped them a lot. Um, our delay group of 30 who started, 27 finished. We had to disqualify one because they made big changes in their diet and it helped them. And we had to disqualify two others because they went to an autism intensive uh, therapy school. 
Um, but basically, we saw very few adverse effects. Two children who we later discovered had very poor nutritional status, were not able to tolerate the uh, vitamin mineral supplement because it's fairly high dose. One child couldn't tolerate the carnitine, two couldn't tolerate the digestive enzymes, and a few children didn't like being put on the healthy um, allergen-free diet. They wanted their candy, they wanted their soda, and so there was some irritability uh, because they weren't allowed those unhealthy foods. Um, but the, I should say the uh, fish oil and the Epsom salt baths are very well tolerated in everyone. Um, so we did a number of tests by our clinicians. Um, one of the major tests we did was a standardized IQ test. And um, it was great, very exciting to see that the children with autism in the treatment group gained seven points of IQ and the non-treatment group had basically no change. They lost half a point. Um, so again, a change in IQ on the standardized IQ test, that's a very powerful measure and that we were able to improve the non-verbal IQ, but not much change in the verbal IQ or in the memory. Um, also, when we look at their developmental age, children with autism are generally developmentally delayed. So the children in our study had a physical age of about 10 years old, but their developmental age was only about half that, about five years old. Over 12 months, the treatment group gained 18 months of development. The non-treatment group gained only four months. They made some progress, but they're developmentally delayed. They're falling behind their peers. Our treatment group began catching up to their peers. So we looked at uh, many different um, areas, and in every area, um, we saw great improvements in the treatment group, and in almost every case, more improvement in the treatment group than the non-treatment group. So if we average over all these areas, so the three major areas are um, receptive and expressive language and writing, personal living skills, um, domestic living skills, community living skills, interpersonal relationships, play and leisure time, coping skills, so emotion regulation. And then average overall, uh, just very striking how much the treatment group began improving compared to the non-treatment group. Um, we looked at the childhood autism rating scale as a standardized assessment. Most of the children started out, uh, the average one was um, just into the severe range. At the end of the study, they were in the mostly on average in the mild to moderate range. Uh, some improvement in the non-treatment group, but not as much. Um, another scale we used, again, we saw somewhat more improvement in the treatment group than the non-treatment group, according to the professionals. And then if we look at the parent evaluations, what did the parents think? And so if we look at the areas of the social responsiveness scale, so this looks at six different areas of social interaction and awareness. We found a, a substantial improvement in the autism, uh, in the treatment group and um, essentially no change in the non-treatment group. Um, if we look at problem behaviors, we saw the treatment group improved more in irritability, they improved more in um, social awareness and lethargy, more in stereotypy, improved more in hyperactivity, and more in inappropriate speech. So on average, about a 26% improvement compared to about a 7% improvement for the non-treatment group. If we look at sensory problems, many children and adults with autism have sensory challenges. We saw the treatment group had some improvement and the non-treatment group really didn't change. They didn't reach normal. Normal would be in the range of 150 to 190, but there was some improvement. There was some reduction in sensory problems. If we look at parent global impressions, and this is similar to this slide I showed you for the vitamin mineral supplement, I won't go through each treatment, but I'll say of the 20 treatments we looked at, you'll see the non-treatment group had little change, sometimes even worsening in some of their symptoms. And the treatment group had substantially more benefit in all of the areas, every one of the 20 areas we looked at. Um, another way to say it is that for the treatment group, 14% of the family said their child was much better. 43% said they were better. 39% slightly better. Only 4% felt there was no change in their child. 
and compared to the non-treatment group, uh, 4% much better, 4% better, 23% slightly better, half with no change, and 15% worsened over time. Um, so again, a good indication of benefit. If we look at how quickly they improved, this is a su surprise to us. We saw that most of the improvement occurred in the first three months. And that was when we added the vitamin mineral supplement and the fish oil, and we just started the um, Epsom salt bath. So it appears that those three treatments were probably the, accounted for most of the benefit. Digestive enzymes, carnitine didn't help too much more, but then the um, healthy diet helped a little bit more at the end. Um, if we look at GI symptoms, there was uh, some improvement in GI symptoms, about 30% compared to 10% in the non-treatment group. Um, if we look at every measure, so I'm now just showing you a plot of the percentage change on every measure we looked at, we see that on average it was about a 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 25 percent improvement on every measure that we looked at. Not a cure by any means, but some benefit, and this is an average. Some children improved more, some didn't have uh, much change. Um, this is the parents' ratings of how effective they think each treatment was. The parents rated the vitamin mineral supplement and the fish oil as the two most beneficial treatments. Epsom salt baths, carnitine, digestive enzymes rated a bit lower, and the healthy diet rated a bit higher. If we asked the parents which treatments they wanted to continue, um, most of them wanted to continue the vitamin mineral supplement and the fish oil. They wanted to continue the Epsom salts, even though it may not have been um, as beneficial. It's just so easy. You just pour the Epsom salts into the bath and have your child or adult take a bath in it two to three times a week. Uh, carnitine helped some, digestive enzymes, some wanted to continue, and the healthy diet seemed to help about two thirds. So no one treatment is going to help everyone. But if you try each one of these treatments together, it's pretty likely that one or several will provide some benefit. I'll mention briefly three special cases. We had one young man who for years had been unable to urinate. No, the urologist could not figure it out. So he had to be catheterized several times a day. Uh, very uncomfortable to have a tube shoved up, up your penis several times a day. Um, and so what was amazing is when he went on the dairy-free diet, he was completely cured within four days. He could finally urinate on his own for, uh, without any problem. But then one day by mistake, the family gave him ice cream. He lost the ability to urinate for four days and then fully recovered until at school, someone gave him a slice of cheese pizza. Again, lost the ability to urinate for four days and gained it back. Very convincing that this child had a major allergy to uh, dairy and surprising that was affecting his ability to urinate. Uh, food allergies can cause a variety of odd problems. A second major improvement, and I'm just going to go over this briefly to leave more time for questions. We had a young girl who's physically very easily fatigued. She could only um, walk a quarter of a mile. If she was on the floor, she couldn't stand up. She could not walk upstairs, and she was nine years old. Um, once she started um, the carnitine supplement, she began skipping around the house. She could walk two miles. She learned to bicycle. It was just amazing improvements. And the wheelchair the family had used for outings was put into storage. We discovered this was because she had very low levels of carnitine, which remember is needed to produce ATP, the energy for the body and the brain. And so we discovered she had very low levels of carnitine. After treating her at the end of the study, she had well above normal levels. Your body can make some carnitine, but you, in most cases, but you get some from your diet. Pretty much the only sources of carnitine in the diet are from cows and from pigs. And she didn't eat either. So that was a big clue. Um, and that was why she benefited so much. And then finally, uh, the, one of the two boys I mentioned who couldn't tolerate the vitamin mineral supplement, he had severe nutritional deficiencies. And when children have severe nutritional deficiencies, they often exhibit pica, meaning they begin eating non-food items, things like dirt, 
and sand and paper. And so within one week of starting a healthy diet, he was completely cured. And they don't use that word easily. He was completely cured of severe pica that he'd had for years just by going on a healthy diet. Um, so um, I'll skip over a few slides in the interest of time. I want to thank the many families who participated in the study, the autism families who supported our work. Most of our work comes from donations from families. We thank all those families. We thank the companies who donated the supplements for our study. And um, I want to bring this home about what we would recommend. So based on our uh, research, we've discovered that the three uh, treatments that seem to help the most people are the vitamin mineral supplement. I think everyone should try it. Uh, the fish oil, I think everyone should try it unless they're eating fish twice a week, and preferably an oily, oily fish like salmon or anchovies. Um, and healthy diet, I think everyone should be on a healthy diet um, and also be consuming um, and trying um, avoiding these common allergens, gluten, casein, soy. Not everyone needs to avoid those, but it's worth trying it. And if it helps, great, stay on it. If it doesn't help, go back and see if there's a problem. Um, the other things to consider, um, carnitine, especially if a child has fatigue uh, and doesn't eat any beef or pork um, twice a week, um, beef is a much better source of carnitine than pork. Epsom salts, 90% chance your child with autism is very deficient in um, sulfate. We put a good amount into a vitamin mineral supplement. Many kids need more from Epsom salt baths as well. And then finally, digestive enzymes, especially if after eating you have stomach upset, loose stools, gaseousness, that's a good clue you need digestive enzymes. Um, we have more information on my website, my personal website, adamsautismresearch.com. I have a lot of general advice there, but you can read our summary there that gives more information. But also, if you're wondering about sources of these treatments, um, again, these treatments are very low risk, very well tolerated. Um, it seems to benefit about 80% of children and adults. It only takes a few minutes. They're relatively inexpensive compared to other therapies. A vitamin mineral supplement, um, you can order it from a nonprofit. So I give you the website there. Our nonprofit also has what we call the ANRC protocol, which is uh, recommendations on how to phase in, how to add in the vitamin supplement, and then the fish oil, and then the carnitine, and then the healthy diet. Um, for our fish oil, we used a source from Nordic Naturals. Um, there are many other sources as well. Um, that you can consider using, but it's important to test. Some fish oils are much better quality than others. The way to know, a good way to know if a fish oil is uh, healthy or not is to smell it. If it smells bad, it tastes bad, it is bad. Um, fish oil can go rancid very easily, so it's very important to get a high quality fish oil that should have just a very mild uh, taste to it. Epsom salts, you should be able to get in most pharmacies. Uh, carnitine, we used um, a brand from Now Foods, but there are many other companies that make carnitine. There are two types of carnitine, L-carnitine and acetyl-L-carnitine. One of our studies used L-carnitine, one of our studies used acetyl. Acetyl is not as well absorbed, so we strongly recommend instead using the L-carnitine form. Some children need a little, some need a very high amount. And so it's worth trying a very high dose, especially if your child is fatigued easily, either physically or mentally fatigued. Because remember, your brain uses the most energy uh, in your body. Digestive enzymes, we used a specialized version that's similar to Trienza from Houston Enzymes. But again, there are many other companies. And then healthy diet. I'm going to emphasize the healthy part. So people often say, I'm going to go on a dairy-free diet, and they go from eating uh, uh, gluten-free diets. So they'll go from eating cookies to gluten-free cookies. That's not a good improvement. So you want to go from eating uh, candy and sugar to eating vegetables and whole fruit and good quality protein. Uh, so you can go to our website, again, to see our uh, multi-step 
uh, ANRC protocol for recommendations. And again, I don't have any financial connection uh, with these companies. Um, I will mention that we are um, just starting another um, study of vitamins and minerals. This is a small study for uh, 20 children. We advertised it a couple days ago. It's primarily for people who live in Arizona or willing to come to Arizona twice. Uh, it will be testing out our latest version of our vitamin mineral supplement, and we're doing very expensive pre and post testing. We're spending about $5,000 on each child to try to figure out exactly what is, um, uh, their metabolic and nutritional problems are and see how um, effective a vitamin mineral supplement is and get guidance on how to try to continue improving it even more. So um, I tried to finish a little early so I could leave time for questions. Um, we also have a probiotic study going on with Sun Genomics. So if you want to try um, enroll in our probiotic study, that's again an option. And that's unlimited. Almost anyone uh, age 2 to 75 can enroll in that. We already have 200 some people enrolled and there's no limit. Um, so I'll stop there and, and take questions. So Perfect. thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Actually, it was an amazing breakdown of your study and it actually answered a bunch of questions that I already had and that people were already asking. I do want to remind everyone, just in case they didn't know, that actually Dr. Adams will be back um, with ANRC, um, excuse me, not ANRC, excuse me, ARC, to, um, on July 9th to discuss his vitamin mineral supplement study. Um, but moving forward, I wanted to ask a great question from Patricia Spirit Lemer. Wonderful, Patricia. Um, her question was, how did you decide on the order of treatment? Oh, that's a wonderful question. And we thought a lot about it. Um, honestly, the order probably doesn't matter too much. But because of our prior research, we know that many children with autism are on self-limited diets. When you're on a self-limited diet, um, and a classic diet would be just French fries and chicken nuggets, you're just not getting enough vegetables and fruit. And most people in the U.S. aren't getting enough. And so we thought that was probably one of the most important areas to try. And we'd already done that previous study showing it was beneficial. Um, but it was important to do that before we do the fish oil. Because in a very large study done by a colleague of mine at New York University, about 2% of kids with autism, when they start taking fish oil, causes severe behavioral problems, severe aggression. And we just was discovered that's due to a carnitine deficiency. And so our vitamin mineral supplement has a few other extra nutrients in it. Um, so that's why we call it ANRC plus. Uh, so it includes some carnitine enough to prevent carnitine deficiency. So then everyone was able to tolerate our fish oil. Um, the healthy diet, you could start first. But in our experience, it's very, very hard for some families to implement a healthy diet. It works a lot better if the parents implement it too. You know, if you're eating pizza in front of your child or you're eating candy and you're giving your child broccoli, you're, you're gonna expect some behavior problems. So it really helps if the whole family goes on the diet. So we did that last simply because we knew compliance would be harder. Um, but the other treatments um, only seem to benefit a subset of individuals. So that's why we recommend trying them later. So the most important things are what we recommend trying first. But if you know, for example, your child has, uh, is very easily fatigued and never eats any beef or pork, you probably want to try carnitine sooner. If you know after eating ice cream, they have severe gaseousness and pain, well, you could just stop giving them ice cream, but you could also start giving them digestive enzymes. So I, I hope that helps. Does that answer the question? Uh, I, I think I think uh, you're, you're on mute, though, Jessica. I'm sorry about that. Um, that absolutely answered the question. Thank you so much. And um, another person, Maria Coral, had asked if, regarding the Epsom salt bath, if she could use Epsom cream. Like, what are your thoughts on Epsom cream versus Epsom baths? Yeah, it's certainly plausible that it could work, um, that the Epsom creams, uh, will can, if they contain magnesium sulfate, um, though it should absorb well through the skin because when you're taking a bath, that's also how it's absorbed. 
but no one's ever studied it to see if it works as well as an Epsom salt bath. So all I can tell you is we know Epsom salt bath about two to three times a week works very well for raising sulfate levels. Um, I'd like to see a study on the lotion, but it may work as well. So if a child doesn't want to take baths, I think it's fine to use a lotion. Um, again, 90% of children have very, very low sulfate. They're, they're sulfate deficient. And it's so important for so many aspects of metabolism. Absolutely. Um, and um, Enrique, um, had actually mentioned before um, we went on our on, on our chat. Um, it's something an interesting thing regarding diet because when looking at your graph and looking at um, where parents saw the most improvement and also where you guys saw the most improvement, um, one of them was the diet. So it's interesting that you know a little bit more than half of your um, of the people involved in the study said they would continue with diet. And Enrique and I were chatting. Um, as well regarding a study in 2010, and it was published in the Journal of Internal Medicine regarding um, how celiac disease can present as autism. Now, obviously this is one child, but still it was an interesting study. And basically he was um, diagnosed with severe autism and then they started him on a gluten-free diet and began supplementation based off of his nutritional deficiencies. And actually his gastrointestinal, basically it's confirming what you're saying, um, his gastrointestinal um, issues, uh, uh, you know, were no more. And actually he started to lose his uh, autism diagnosis. Now, again, this is an extreme, amazing, you know, story. Um, but it's an interesting thing to mention, uh, regarding diet, how much it can really, um, it can improve so much of your symptoms. If again, like you said, not everyone is sensitive to every single thing, but just from the studies that have been shown, it's around 80% or more, um, have been shown to have a benefit just by removing gluten and casein, which are inflammatory foods, basically for everyone, as you mentioned with the baby cows. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but it kind of made me circle back to, you know, how, how important is diet, do you really think? Do you think when they saw even more improvement with the diet at the end, do you think by trying to stick it out a little bit more, even if it's hard um, to really try to get those vegetables in, remove those inflammatory foods, and again, you know, address those nutritional deficiencies? Yeah, so let me answer it in several ways. Uh, first of all, for celiac disease, only a very few percent, small percentage of children with autism seem to have full-blown official celiac disease, maybe of order one to 2%, but um, many more of them seem to be gluten sensitive. So it won't show up as a, as a standard positive on a standard um, celiac test, but still many of them are gluten sensitive and seem to benefit from it. Um, so I think it's well worth trying to avoid that. Um, in terms of you know, benefit, um, the, the best way to know if a diet is helping, the gold standard approach of, of any allergist immunologist is to uh, first go on a very clean diet and then add the problematic food back in and see if that is causing the problem. So if you go on a very clean diet, um, rice and uh, vegetables, fruit, uh, healthy protein, and see if you see uh, improvements. And then later, if you try adding those foods back in, you can see if problems return. For some children, the, the sensitivity can be extreme, that just a bite of a cookie can be enough to cause major problems. That's surprising to people. And yet, if you think about peanut allergies, for some people, just one peanut could kill them. And so if you realize how it's not the food that's the problem, it's the body's extreme overreaction to the food that's the problem. So with these allergic reactions, we simply think the issue is that the body's immune system is overactive. Now, one of the reasons for that may be due to low vitamin D, um, because low vitamin D is a major problem with um, uh, regulating the immune system. In fact, we did a COVID-19 study, which I might just briefly mention, where we found that people who had low levels of vitamin D had basically twice the severity of COVID and it lasted twice as long. And there are other studies which show similar effects. So most people, uh, many people don't get nearly enough vitamin D, and especially during COVID, if you're hiding indoors, you're just not getting the sunlight you need to make it. So vitamin D, very important to regulate the immune system. 
and may help with some of these allergic issues. Um, but what we've heard from many physicians and families is that over time, if they can heal the gut, then a lot of those food allergies go, go away. But the, the problem in many cases is that you have what's called intestinal, perme intestinal permeability or leaky gut. So the connections between the cells and the gut are not tight and therefore partly digested food and waste leaks from the gut into the rest of the body. And the body says, whoa, these, this partly digested food shouldn't be here and so it launches an immune attack against it. But if you can heal the gut, uh, see, stop that intestinal permeability, then often we'll see those food allergies go away. So some food allergies uh, in autism can certainly disappear as time goes on if you can heal the gut. So sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer, but. No, absolutely. We, we absolutely, the more information uh, for the audience, absolutely, um, they will appreciate that. There's also, it's kind of a specific question, but it, it kind of uh, circles back to your um, L-carnitine um, comment. Um, and this question is from Sangeeta Sher. Um, my son is unable to tolerate any long chain fatty acids, any oils other than safflower oil, um, causes him to regress, even olive oil. Would L-carnitine supplementation help him tolerate fish oils and other oils? Absolutely, absolutely for fish oil. We know that um, the reason these children had severe, I mean, really severe severe behavioral reactions within a week, you know, attacking their parents, um, that was in every case um, easily treated with a small amount of carnitine. Um, and so, um, certainly for fish oils, that's um, an important issue. It seems to help with transporting um, medium chain fatty acids into um, the um, mitochondria, but also helps transporting them out. So if they aren't able to tolerate other oils, um, I'm not positive about those other oils. I'm not sure we know, but it, you could try cautiously. So giving enough carnitine first, and you can see our papers for the dosages we used. We used quite high doses that we, for a vitamin, for our fish oil study, we're using sometimes 10 times what people have used in other fish oil studies. Um, so we're using of order one to two grams a day. And when people go up to four, four grams a day, that's the level you need to reach to improve heart function. So the major adverse effect, if you can call it that, of extra fish oil is you have a lower chance of a heart attack. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, awfully safe stuff to take. Um, Sorry, I couldn't. And so the um, so I think many people are underdosing with fish oil, and um, with carnitine, we went with a pharmaceutical level dosing, uh, fifty milligrams per kilo, and another study did twice the dose and found even more benefit. So I think it's important to um, tie to top try to titrate to the individual. Some children may need it more than others. We always recommend with any supplement, start low, gradually increase. With a vitamin mineral supplement, we gradually increased it a little bit each week uh, to reach the full level. And a few families still had to stay at a lower dose, but most reached the full dose. Okay, wonderful. And um, another question would be, um, you know, you've been doing this for, you know, couple of years now, I think it's 30 <laughs> based off of the research. Um, and you know, for those parents who are, you know, strapped and are just trying, you know, their best to do, what can they do? Where can they see like the most bang for their buck? What are your thoughts on testing for your, for the children? Um, what do you think are, have been the most beneficial tests where you can get the most information I mean, maybe like the least also invasive testing for the children? What are your thoughts through your 30 years of research from what you've seen um, so you can base your, you know, supplementation off of those tests. Yeah. So the test I would recommend with, the first is my favorite test. It's a free test. We call it the toilet test. Look in the toilet at your child's poop. And if your child's poop looks bad and smells bad, it is bad. 30% of your child's poop is gut bacteria. And so we've had so many families in our study tell us, when we send them to go evaluate the child's stool, say, wow, I had no idea how bad my child's GI problems were until I looked. Because once a child's you know, a few years old, you don't normally ask them, so how was your poop today? 
you don't go into the bathroom and look at it anymore. So in our culture, at least in, in the U.S., we don't do that. And that's a big problem. But the, the stool tells you a lot about their GI health. So that's the first test I would absolutely recommend doing. A second test is many children um, are low in iron, especially young children. And then girls, once they hit puberty, 10% um, of uh, girls and women in the U.S. Uh, have iron deficiency. So young children and girls in particular, I'd recommend an iron test. Most insurance companies should cover it. It's $10. Um, next would be a vitamin D test. If your child is, basically look at your child's skin. If your child is tanned, their vitamin D level is probably okay. But if they're not tanned, then probably their vitamin D level is low and you can spend $50 on a test of it. Um, but it's especially important for dark skin people. Um, in the US, the CDC says that roughly 70% of people who are black have a full-blown vitamin D deficiency. I mean, that's really serious. And roughly 50% of Hispanics. And so people who are dark skinned just need a lot more time in the sun. So bottom line is if you're not tanned, you probably need extra vitamin D. Uh, um, so those I think are some of my favorite tests to begin with. Um, but a test should really just be to guide you towards treatment. So if I think about the treatments that I mentioned, you know, you could spend, we're spending $1,000 to measure the level of every vitamin and every mineral. But I don't recommend that to families. I recommend just try the supplement. If it helps, your child's response to the supplement is the best way to know if it's helping them or not. With fish oil, again, 80% of people in the U.S. just aren't getting enough fish. Um, so unless you're eating fish regularly, just eat the fish. Just take the fish oil. Um, you can do allergen tests. Allergen tests on the skin are IgE tests, and those tell you about an immediate reaction. But delayed reactions are governed by IgG and IgM, and those reactions might take one to several days. Those tests are somewhat dubious as to how accurate they are. They can give them, they may be able to give you a clue as to what foods to try avoiding, but most uh, expert allergists I speak with say they just don't believe in them. And what they believe is try removing the food. And if the symptom goes away, that's very compelling. And then if you add the food back in and the symptom returns, that's conclusive. That's the gold standard test for allergies. So I'm, although there are a lot more lab testing one could do, um, again, those basic things I mentioned, for a few dollars, you'd be surprised how, how valuable they can be. So I hope that helps. No, absolutely. I mean, that was, that's not actually what I thought you were going to say. So those are some pretty cheap tests because <laughs> um, parents spend obviously hundreds of dollars on testing. And so I absolutely agree. You know, the, uh, the toilet test could be the most, you know, could be the most biggest. Very item. important. It's very, it's very important. important. Yeah. I mean, we actually recommend families do a daily stool record for 14 days. And that way we see not just what does a stool look like, but how often is someone having a bowel movement? You know, when some families tell us, wow, I didn't realize my child was only pooping once every five days. No wonder they become in great pain and irritable on that fourth and fifth day. And then when they finally have a bowel movement, they're much happier. They're out of pain. Um, you know, it's just, it's simple things like that that can make such a difference. Absolutely. And one of the questions from uh, Leona Collins, it's, uh, she asks, are these deficiencies absorbent based? Basically saying, is the gut not absorbing these nutrients? Um, it's a variety of issues. Um, so I think for much of what I've discussed, it's simply not having good intake. Uh, vitamin, most vitamins and minerals are pretty well absorbed. Um, so, and that's usually not the problem. Uh, protein is a separate issue because protein is a long molecule and needs to be chopped up into individual amino acids. So some people may not have the right uh, digestive enzymes or digestive system to break protein up into those small molecules. 
Um, and I mentioned that with digestive enzymes, some people just lack the enzymes they need to digest certain types of foods, especially carbohydrates and especially the sugar in milk. Um, unfortunately, I have to get going for another uh, meeting, but um, I do want to thank you guys very much for having me. I'm very glad to answer questions and um, I hope it was helpful. Absolutely. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and to um, go over your amazing study. Um, and just a reminder that at Dr. Adams will be back on July 9th and we will link some information um, about the ANRC supplementation in the comments after. Uh, thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks. Bye.